Hello everyone, this is Mr. Couple. I'm joined here today with my IB Physics HL Year 1 class. Say hello everyone. Hello. Hi. Hey. Hello. Hey. We're going to be doing, we're doing an experiment today uh, to determine the refractive index of a material. This is coming from the IB Physics Standards, this one right here, Applications and Skills, underneath, what is this topic? 4.4 Wave Behavior. We'll be determining the refractive index experimentally. Somehow we're going to do this with online learning. It's going to be awesome. So I have three main ideas from the lesson today uh, that I want you guys to take away from this. So first up, I want you to know how to use a protractor to measure the angles of incidence and refraction. Remember, this is the angle of incidence. I don't know if you guys can see my mouse cursor or not, but I'm cursoring here. This is the angle of incidence. I should just draw on it angle of incidence, and then you got the angle of refraction down there. So how do we use a protractor to measure those angles? The second one is what the um, the IB standard was, or the application skill, was that we want to be able to use Snell's law to experimentally determine the refractive index. So you can see down here, this material has an unknown refractive index. We're going to try to figure it out. And then lastly, I want you guys, of course, like any IB student, to be able to analyze data, propagate uncertainties, and make conclusions. So please make sure that you've pulled up this simulation. I linked it in the chat. Please have it pulled up because we're going to be using it today. When you first load up the simulator, uh, it will, let me reload this. It's going to ask you to choose between three different simulations. The one that we want to use is the intro. The other ones are, are um, like if you go, I'll just show you this one real quick. So this one's cheating because it lets you actually view the angle. Uh, we don't want that. That's cheating. We want to have to actually estimate the angles and that way we can have uncertainties and things like that. So you're going to want to make sure you choose the intro version of this. You'll notice down here in the corner, there's some tools. You can pull those tools over. You got a protractor tool and you also have an intensity tool. We're not going to be using the intensity tool because Snell's law doesn't care about intensity. It only cares about the angles. We are going to start in air because it's just a common material. We also know that the index of refraction is about one. So it'll make things easier for us. And we're going to switch the material to mystery A. We don't want a material where we already know the refractive index. We're trying to experimentally determine the refractive index. So that's your setup. And then you're done. That's it. Just make sure you turn on the laser over here by pushing the button. What questions do you guys have for me about setup? Yeah, it's easy. Okay, here are four questions that I'm going to have you guys answer here through dialogue. So just jump in and uh, say what you think. How do we measure the angles of incidence and refraction and send a screenshot in chat? So I'll pull up the chat and then I want you guys to paste screenshots in here of how you think we should lay out the protractor. So where do I need to put this protractor to be able to measure the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction? So if you guys can send your screenshots into chat, that'd be awesome. Or you can just talk out loud. Where do I put the protractor? So we can answer out loud? Yeah. Okay, so would it just be like um, in the middle, basically, where the line matches the dashed line? So here? But down. Down? Like where do we like, want me to? Where the um, the half circle on the top matches. Yeah, like that. Okay, anyone else? Thank you, Anna. That was Anna, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Anyone no, else have doesn't work. any other ideas? Keyboard doesn't work. So let's go with this one. Whoa. Someone's farting. <laughs> okay. So uh, what would be the angle of incidence in this case? Can I zoom in on this? Um... I can't zoom in on it. Would it be like for my screen? 40? Oh, wait, no. Be like 40 or 50. Let's see. So, this is what's this one? 90. So, right now, is it 90? It's zero. 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 Yeah, that's zero. I'm trying to make sure. I need to make sure that that line is exactly that 90 right there, that that flat line is exactly on the the boundary between the two. And then we need to make sure that our center line is exactly on the normal. So we're set up. We're perfect right now. So then what would this be? Uh, this one right there. What's that? Make this bigger. Um, is that 20? Yeah, that looks like 20. So it looks like it's going... Every one of these large ticks is a 5. So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Yep. Okay. okay. 
So the angle of incidence is measured to the normal. Okay, what about the refraction? So uh, I'm going to start at zero, and I, I'm going to go to 30. Tell me when it reaches 30. Just say stop, and I'll stop there. Stop. When it, is it at 30 right now? The refractive angle of refraction. Oh, oh okay. It never reaches 30. Why not? Why not? Why doesn't it reach 30? That's weird. Well, so the refractive the angle of refraction is down there. So that leads into one of my other questions. Uh, show show that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. What angle of reflection? What is that? What's the angle of reflection? It's the one on the right side. Yep. So this is your angle of reflection. So notice, so we're going to show that if I go to 60 over here, that my reflection is also at 60. Well, it should be. It's not. That means my protractor is slightly off. So I'm going to move it there. Okay, now I'm good. So you'll notice that the angle that it bounces off at, that's your reflection, is always equal to the angle of incidence. Whatever angle you're coming out at, you're bouncing off at that same angle. Notice that the reflected beam is a little bit transparent. Why would that be? It loses intensity? You got it exactly right. So some of the wave is going transmitting through the material and the rest of it's bouncing off. So not all of it is bouncing off. So you have less intensity on the reflection than you do on the um, transmission. Okay, what other questions do I have? State how the refractive index of mystery material A compares to the refractive index of air. So how does the refractive index of this mystery material compare to air? What do you guys think? Wait, so I'm still kind of confused on mm -hmm. what the refractive index is. So the refractive index is the speed of light divided by the speed of, of light in the material. The speed of light in a vacuum divided by the speed of light in the material. Okay. It It's a basic a measurement of how fast light travels through a material. So my question is, how does the index of refraction of mystery material A mm -hmm. compare to the index of refraction of air, which is 1? And so what you have to do is you have to look at, well, what, is, what does the light do? Does it bend when it goes through? It's bending towards the normal, not bending away from the normal. So for instance, if I change this from air to a different material, is it gonna, it's not even letting me change it. What the heck? I, I don't know why it's not letting me change it. What's going on? Let me close my webcam real quick. Okay, it is letting me change it. It was just popping up behind my camera. So if I change this to glass and I change this to water, look at what happens to the to the angle. The angle that we're coming in at, it actually is bending out from the normal. So if I go back to Mr. A, it's bending towards the normal. So what does that tell you when the light bends away or towards the normal? You guys remember the rule? There's like the one rule I want you to remember about refraction. If it's bending towards the normal, the, uh, the index of the second material should be higher. Yep, so we're bending towards, so the the angle, if we had kept going straight, it would have gone like this, and since it's bent towards the normal, if you have a bending in this direction, then that means that N2 is greater than N1. So we know for sure that N of this material is greater than what value? So N2 has to be greater than what value? 1. Has to be greater than 1. Well, I mean, it's not hard to be greater than one because one is the lowest you can be. So that doesn't really help us. But anyway, just wanted to check to make sure you guys remember that. Bending towards a normal means you're increasing the index of refraction. And then the last one, create a situation of total internal reflection. Send a screenshot in chat. Create a situation of total internal reflection and send a screenshot in chat. You guys will remember... N1 and N2, in order for total internal reflection to occur, something has to be true about N1 compared to N2. Let's see what you guys came up with. Go ahead, Ryan. No?
So we can review from last time. So over here, where was it? So if we want to have total internal reflection, then we need the angle of refraction to be increasing. So in this case, uh, the angle is going to come in at this, at this critical angle here. That's our angle of incidence. And then we need the outgoing angle to not be towards the normal, but to rather bend away from the normal. So as it bends away from the normal, that means that the index of refraction needs to be doing what? If we, if when you're in situations of total internal reflection, refraction, the light is bending away from the normal. And so, how do you do that? By going into material that has. This one's good. Who is that? It's Alberto. Good job, Alberto. So, what is Alberto? How did he get that to work? What did he do? Are you guys still there? Everyone's all really quiet. You're freaking me out. Um, I'm not sure um, about yeah. this one. I don't really understand the total internal refraction thing. I'm trying to get my keyboard to work. <laughs> um, material uh, one has to be higher than material two. That's correct. So you need to start in a more optically dense material and then try to transition to one that's less dense. And so that's what's going on here, is that you're underneath water, that's your N1, well the index of refraction of water is 1.33, and then you're transitioning into air, where the index of refraction is about 1.0. So total internal, ref total internal reflection, I think I said refraction earlier, total internal reflection can only occur when you're starting out in a more optically dense material. So if you look at what Alberto put, he's starting out in water, and then going into air. This is when total internal reflection occurs, when you're going from a more dense material, trying to go into a less optically dense, lower N, and it can't get through because of this harsh angle here, so it ends up bouncing off. So see if you guys could all recreate that, and then post a screenshot for me, if you can. I'm gonna grab this one. So if N1 isn't greater than N2, you could come out at any angle you want to. So if I go back here, so I could choose any angle I want and it'll always refract. But if I switch it, I'll move myself over here. If I switch it to water, trying to go into air, now there's only a few angles that I can use that actually transmit through. I hit that critical angle right there and now it can't transmit anymore. Man, I'm still in the way. So we're able to refract from water into air only through this very small window, this small angle here, uh, angle window. Anything past that, you're not able to refract through. This can only happen when you're going from a higher N to a lower N, when more optically dense to less optically dense. Okay, what questions do you guys have for me about this? So refraction um, is whenever it's... Wait, what's refraction? Refraction is when the, the light path bends when it changes mediums. Okay, okay. So the refraction is down below, and then the reflection is up above. So the reflection is where it bounces back, like an echo, and then the refraction is where it transmits through. Okay, so let's put this back to what we had, air and mystery A. Okay, so that's our setup. Oh, I'm going to look for more questions. Okay, good job, Ryan. Robert, looks great. All right, yep. Nice job, guys. Thank you for the screenshots. Awesome. Okay, what we want to do now is we want to derive a mathematical model that we can determine N2. Well, we already know what the mathematical model is. It's called, you guys know the name of it, right? Say it. The name of the mathematical law that we use for I can't refraction. Remember. You guys don't Snell. remember. Snell's, Snell's law. law. Snell's law. 
Well, what, what is Snell's law? N one sine theta one. N two equals N two sine theta two. That's it. All of you guys that turned in your answer to that last problem, you all got it correct. So good job on that. Everybody that I looked at this morning, you all nailed it. So great work. Okay, what are we trying to find? N2. We're trying to find N2. Okay, now let's think about the simulation. So every time you do an experiment and you have a model, you want to think about what's my independent variable, what's the thing that I can change, and then what's the thing that I'm measuring that changes in response to that. So what are we able to control here in this simulation? What are we able to actually directly control? The angle of incidence. We're able to control the angle of incidence. And then in response to that, we can measure... The angle of refraction. The angle of refraction. So looking back over here, the independent variable, the thing that we're controlling is theta one, that's our independent variable. And the thing that we're going to measure is a dependent variable. And so what does that make N1 and N2? What are those? Are those variables at all? No. What are they? The, um, they're given. Constant? The material? Yeah, they're constants. Well, we need I to got make... My keyboard. We have to make sure that they're constant. So we can't allow those to change. So if you're doing this experiment in real life, you would make sure that you didn't have like, you know, impurities in the material or like weird, like turbulent flows or things that are messing it up. You just want to make sure that the material is as steady and static and constant as possible. The temperature also changes the uh, refractive index. So you want to make sure that the water has a constant temperature. So if you were trying to do this in real life, whatever this material is down here, you try to make sure that its temperature remain constant. That's actually a really good IA topic is to check to see how changing the temperature changes the refractive index. All right, so to do a little bit of processing, uh, as we know, we always need to graph. We need, always need to make a graph. And when you make a graph, you always put the independent variable on which axis. independent variable goes on which axis x and the dependent goes y on the y and then we'll have some sort of a graph here i'll just do a, a linear shape we don't really know what it's going to be yet it's going to be some weird sinusoidal thing but the idea is that you want to try to extract that constant information off of your graph of the two variables so you put the variables on your axes, and then that constant data can get extracted off your graph. Okay, so we need to rearrange things because we know y equals mx plus b is the equation of a line. All right, so that's what your b value is, and then the gradient is your m. And then you've got your y-axis corresponding to your dv, your, your, and then the x-axis corresponding to your independent variable. So we need to rearrange this equation in pink. We need to rearrange this equation to make it look like y equals mx plus b. So how would I do that? Let's see. So I would need to make sure that it doesn't say, um, it needs to say y equals. So it needs to be dv equals. If you look at it right now, it does not say dv equals. So the first thing we need to do is move this n2 over to the other side. So if the first manipulation we'll make is to say sine theta 2. That's our y value, that's the y-axis value, is equal to, and then what am I going to have on the right-hand side after doing that? In one, in one sine two. theta 1 over in 2? Yeah, so I'm going to write it this way. So the reason I wrote it that way was because uh, if, we, if we look at it now, so this is basically our y, so that's our, our y-axis. This is our x-axis, and so then what does that make that coefficient in front of the sine theta 2? Constant. You have a typo. Where is it? I do have a typo. What did I screw up? Is it this one? Yeah. Thank you, Kong. That's theta 1. Thanks. How about a, an error? I have an error. <laughs> I'm not typing. Uh, so what is... Right Oh, righto. <laughs> <laughs> so what is this? Looking over here at what would be a linear model. 
your trends. Right. Trend? We have a name for it. Slope or Slope. gradient. We, we use British English in this in this class. That's the gradient. That's it. That's, used, that's our model. Hmm? I used trend because I couldn't remember gradient. Gotcha. And that's the model for this experiment. So what do we need to measure? Well, we need to measure the sign of the initial angle, the sign of the second angle, and based on those measurements, we can calculate the index of refraction. Now notice what we're looking for is we're trying to find N2, and N2 is on the bottom down there, which is kind of weird, but that's that's just how this is working out. All right, so we're going to start our data collection now. Uh, this is what our data table is going to look like, so we're going to go create this data table. Let me see how I'm doing on time. We got nine minutes on my clock. So we want to create this this data table and then start the data collection. Uh, I'm going to show you guys how I did this. So let me pull up uh, Excel. I think I already have Excel loaded. I do. I'm going to make a new tab. So when I use Greek letters and stuff like that, I use I always use symbol salad. There are other ways of doing this. Like there's like keyboard shortcuts and stuff like that. But I, I just like having it all in one place. So symbol salad is an amazing uh, website. Uh, thank you to whoever this dude is, Kev Pluck. Like you're the best. I use your website all the time. Maybe I should buy him some coffee. Hmm. Well, anyway, so I want theta, so I'm going to click on theta, and then that gets copied to my clipboard, and I'm going to come over here, and then I know that I want theta in all of these slots. So I'm going to put a theta here, 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 because I know I'm going to want that theta in all those places. So I don't want to have to keep copying theta like over and over again, so I'm going to copy it a bunch. I'm also going to make this a little, little bit bigger. I like to center everything both in within the cell itself vertically and horizontally. I also like to label my raw data just so I remember what's what. Okay, so we're going to want to, the raw data that we're recording, our raw values are we're recording the theta 1 and we're recording the theta 2. Don't worry about any of this like, you know, signs and stuff like that yet. This is just the straight up raw data. So in the raw, we're, we're measuring theta 1 and we're measuring theta 2. Okay, so let me go back to Excel. All right, uh, where did I... What the heck did I do? <laughs> I have two copies of this open. Okay, here we go. So now I'm going to want to put theta 1, so back to symbol salad. So symbol salad, I'm going to take this subscript 1 and click on that. Not the superscript, we want the subscript. And then I'm going to put that on this one. And I'm going to put it on this one. Okay, the other ones are theta twos. So now I'm going to go back to symbol salad, salad, grab my subscript two, throw them on there. Okay, now why do I have two theta ones? Anyone can tell me? Is one going to be for the uncertainty? Yep, one's going to be for the uncertainty. So now I'm going to come grab the... Delta, which is for the absolute error, the absolute uncertainty. Put it in front of that one, press enter, and put it in front of this one, press enter. So I'm making sure to, I'm typing it up here in the formula bar. I think if you try to type down here, you might it might sometimes delete what you're trying to write. Let me zoom in. Okay, so, so you got to double click. Data. Oh yeah, you got to double click to edit the cell. Thank you for reminding me of that. If you guys didn't know, you double click to edit it. That's what we call expert blind spot, where like I'm so used to doing something that I forget that um, to explain how to do it because it's so ingrained in me. Okay, that's the raw. Uh, we want to make sure that we leave room for five data points. So one, two, three, four, five. If you want, you can add a border around that just to remind yourself like I want to collect this data. So that way I remember that this is the data that I need to fill in. Then we'll do the next table, which is going to be the processed data. So what we're going to need to do is when we graph these quantities, checking chat M, okay. <laughs> when we when we make our graph over here, we're actually graphing the sign of these angles. We're not graphing the angles themselves, the raw angles. We're graphing the sign of the angles, so that way it's going to be a linear graph. So back over here, the process data then needs to be sign of theta one. And then needs, I'm just, you know what I'm gonna do is just copy all of these guys. And then all we gotta do is just put sign in front of it. Okay. 
and I just realized I have a mistake. Does anyone see it? Because there are actually multiple ways that you can measure angles, and I have not specified which way I was measuring these angles. Oh, well, you gotta add units. I didn't put the unit. So what unit are we using to measure the angle? Degrees. We're using degrees. And so I will, I'm holding down shift and pressing left arrow. I'm going to copy that and then go into these guys and paste it over here to all of them. So that way you don't have to type that a thousand times. But yeah, we need to specify that all of those angles are being measured in degrees. Do I need to put them down below for the signs? Yes. What, what unit do I put for the sign of a degree? It's quiet. Let's talk, just be degrees. let's talk about trig real quick. So if I have a triangle and this angle is 30 degrees, let's say that, um, I don't remember what the ratios are. This is like root three. Is that what it is? It's like root three and this is one or something like that. And this is, I, is this two? No. Hypotenuse is two. Is that Hypotenuse what, is, is it? Okay, thank you. I never Hypotenuse remember. has to be greater than both. Is those. that it? Is that it? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so let's say these are... These Wait, are, no, the, the, the opposite the of 30 around. is one. Yeah. Is it? Yeah, and then the 60 degrees is square root three. Like, yeah, that. like that. Okay. <laughs> so let's say that the units on here are like these are distances. Like these are distances. So these are meters. Meters, meters, meters. So what's sine of 30? One half? Yeah, it's one meter over two meters. So what are the units of sine of an angle? None. Yeah, it's unitless. It's just a ratio. So there's no units for the sign. So we don't need to put any units down below. Cool. It also makes sense because if these things don't have units, right, if the sine theta and the sine theta don't have units, then that means that the N also doesn't have units, which is correct. N is a dimensionless quantity. There is no units on it. Okay, any other questions on the setup? Where did you get the uh, numbers from? Or are those just random numbers? Or No, this is the special right triangles. You memorize them. There's 30, 60, 90 special right triangle and a 45, 45 special right triangle. And as you can see, I don't have it memorized. Yeah, that's just an example. Yeah. Okay, so back to the simulation. So what we want to do is we want to choose a variety of angles here that we can measure the out from, like the angle coming out at. So the rule is we need five data points to have a reliable experiment. But the second thing you need to consider is you want a spread of data. So you should try to see like what's the smallest value that I can put in and what's the largest value that I can put in and then try to break that up into increments so you can have five data points. So what would be a good thing to increment by here in this experiment so we're guaranteed a spread of data? What should we be incrementing by? Any any thoughts? 15 degrees. 15. 15. So we go here, that'd be 1, 2, 3, 4. Yeah, 15 is perfect. 5. Yep, 15 is exactly what you want to do. So I'm going to come back here, and I'm going to go 15, 30, 45, 60 and then 75. So the way it always works is your independent variable is always something that you can punch in right away because you already know what it's going to be. That's literally why it's called the independent variable because we've already decided what it's going to be. Now, what are the uncertainties in those? So now you have to think about like, how well do you think you can actually nail? Like if I say go to 15 degrees, are you actually going to be at 15 degrees there? Just ran out of time. No. You're not. Maybe. So what does it look like our plus or minus is there? Like if you look at the thickness of this beam, so how close can we actually get to it? Like if we try to measure just the thickness of this beam, like how thick does it look like this beam is? Maybe I could put it on. 
I don't even, it's really hard to tell. I wish I could zoom in here. Like point three, point two, point three. Like well, how many tick marks do you think? It looks like like three degrees takes up three, sort of. I guess on everyone's screen, it's going to be different based on the resolution of your display. But it does seem like anywhere between about like two or three is probably fair. So over here, you'll make that call. You could either put like a two or a three uh, of what how off you think you are. Now, if you think that you're better than that, like if you think, you know what, I'm pretty sure that I could hit that. Like it even feels like it kind of locks there. Like if you think you can get closer, well then put a put a closer number on there. Uh, I would also recommend this. Here's here's something to think about too. Don't measure from the center of the beam. Measure from the edge. So if you line up, like down here, we've got this lined up to the center. But what if you put this like on this? I put this like on the side of the 30, like there. Then I'll make sure that I put my protractor so it's also on the side. So then down here, if I'm on the 30 here, let's see if I can. This is really hard to do. Uh, these are ways that you can like minimize your uncertainty. Let's see. So, yep. So I'm right on the edge there. So then that means that I'm going to measure the edge down here. And so that way you're taking like this thick beam and instead turning it into a thin line if you measure from the edge of it. But, I'm, you know, you guys are going to have to make your own calls there. But that is, uh, that's what I was, one of the questions I had down here was, what technique will you use to minimize the error in your angle measurements? So if you do decide to put in like a big fat two or three there, which is the thickness of the beam, you're going to have a lot of error when you propagate this forward. It's going to cause a lot of problems. So I try to try to see if you can come up with a better technique of measuring the angle than that. Okay, then what was my other questions? How do we propagate error through a sine function? So you know the rule like when you add like x plus y, you just add the absolute errors. If you're multiplying, you have to add the fractional errors. What do you do if you have a sine? How do you find the, how do you propagate the error through a sine function? So like if I said, like over here, I'll just show you guys. So if, if I do go with this two degrees here, then what would my uncertainty down here be? So I want to find the sine would it just be sine of 2? It would not be. Okay, did that work? No, that didn't work. How do you do it? It's like you take the sine. So I, if I just try to take the sine of the 15, it's it's not going to work. Um, let me just confirm that this isn't working. How does it does? It's usually expecting in radians. Yeah, see, it's expecting this number to be in radians. Oh, I typed the wrong function. So if you type in Excel, you can type degree, there we go. So if you type degrees, you can put in the angle in radians and it will convert it into degrees. So I can do a little nested function here where I take the sine of R15 in degrees and now it'll work. Take the sine, of, uh, that did not work. <laughs> sine of 30 should give me half. It's not working, why isn't this working? Anyone know? I think you have to put in degree instead of degrees. Degrees is the function. Converts radians to degrees. Mother. Aren't you trying to convert degrees to radians? Yes, I am. There. Okay, so it actually is radians. Okay, so sine of radians. This should give me half. Okay, now it's working. <laughs> Dumb. I'm so upset. Why are we converting uh, degrees to radians? Excel, by default, always uses radians. So when you're typing in sine in Excel, it's expecting that number that you put in to be in radians. And since our number is in degrees, we need to convert it into radians. Otherwise, it won't work in, in the spreadsheet in Excel. If you have a calculator, you just set it to degree mode, right? Excel doesn't have a degree mode. So we're telling it to put it into degree mode by saying, hey, the thing we're plugging in needs to be turned into radians, so please turn my degree into radians. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so here's the way that you estimate the uncertainty uh, in in the sign. So what we're going to do is imagine that we've got, um, we've got a sign graph. So sign graph looks like, it looks like this. 
So we're going to put in 15 degrees, which is here, go up from there, and then we're going to get out that value that we got, 0.26. But here's the thing. The value that we plugged in could have been as much higher as plus 2 or as much lower as minus 2. So what we need to do is realize that if we go up from there, that'll give us this minimum value and then go up from there, and that'll give us this maximum value. So what we need to do is we need to take half of that range, of this range of, of the spread right there. We need to figure out half that range, and that'll be our uncertainty in the sign. And I know I'm going over time here, but uh, I, I just want to finish this, and then I'll stop the recording because I think this is really important. So the way you're going to do that is you're going to take um, 0 0.5, so that's half, times, and now I'm going to figure out what this top one is, and then I'm going to subtract what this bottom one is, and then I'll take half of that range. So what is this top one? So this top one is the sign of radians of this one here. It's our value that we put in, so it's our 15 plus our uncertainty. So there we go. This is so complicated. So we're taking the sine of our angle plus 2, making sure that it's in radians. And then we're going to subtract, because that's our maximum value, we're going to subtract the lower one, which is the minus 2. So the sine of radians of our angle subtracted by 2. Ask me questions about this. Wait, so you would it would be to find that for all of them would we do the same thing, but instead it would be thirty plus two and then minus. Yeah. So once you set this up, of. yeah, if we say that it's gonna be two for all of these, then all I need to do is just drag this down and then copy without formatting. And then it will automatically update all of these guys. Yes. Now, remember before you had suggested that we take the sine of 2. So if you take the sine of 2, it's close to that, but it's definitely not that all the way down. So there's less, there's actually less uncertainty up here at the 75 than there is down here at the 15. And the reason why is because the function, the sine function, looking over here, the sine function isn't changing as rapidly up here as it was down there. So if we went up to here, you'd notice that that range would give you a lot smaller of a window when you're up closer to those 90 degree angles than when you're down at those lower angles. And so that's why the uncertainty is actually changing across this function. It's weird, right? But cool. And then how many sig figs do we have on that? Is it two or can we only use one? You can only ever use one. So I will fix that right now. So I need to go this, knock this back to one. There you go. And then you want to make sure that these guys over here are matching in their precision to these. So I'm at the second, I have two decimal places here, I should have two decimal places here. If I have two here, I should have two here. So there you go. So that's how. That's why we have two decimal places on all these numbers, is because these are known to the second decimal place. So your values over here should also be known to the second decimal place. We don't use significant figures when we're doing labs. We use this idea that um, the uncertainty can only have one digit of precision in it. And so all your measurements have to match the same precision as your uncertainty. Okay, that's basically it, guys. So from here on out, what you would do is you'd actually use the simulation to calculate your, to measure your theta twos, do the same thing to propagate and process down to here. You'll make a graph of this data, not this, this one. You'll make a graph of these two things and then do your min-max gradient lines, and then you should be able to calculate the slope from that. If you have any other questions, just drop by office hours. I could even make another video if you guys think that you need it. So just communicate with me and let me know what you need. Okay? Okay. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording. If you guys want to stick around and ask me more questions, you can. But I'll see you guys later. If you need anything, please find me on the office hours on Discord or, you know, email me or talk to me on Google Classroom. See you guys later.